Hello, everyone. Hey, can you hear me okay? Um, thank you for the warm intro. Let's see if this works. Okay. Um, thank you for having me here today. I'm super excited. I love Paris. I'm so excited about Web3. I'm so excited about Web3 projects, especially when they succeed. Um, the thing I hate is then they get hacked, they get breached, and then they go down um, and crash. And I came here today to talk to you with this very brief 10 minutes talk uh, about basically how to prevent that. So, sorry. So, quick uh, background about myself. You heard I basically do security at Fireblocks. Um, for those who don't know, Fireblocks, we do um, a digital asset management platform. We offer that to many businesses across the globe with many different use cases that you can see on the bottom of the screen. Um, anything from treasury management to tokenization, DeFi trading, and payments. Uh, so far, uh, we are working with 1,800 plus different customers, secured over four trillion US dollars worth of transactions, and our customers, those 1,800, those 1800 uh, customers have created so far uh, 130 million different wallets on our platforms. Uh, we have a variety of uh, different logos here from the biggest banks in the world to payment companies, um, to Web3 brands, uh, we're really excited to work with all of them. And today we're gonna talk about Web3 security. So if you look from the attacker's perspective at Web3 projects, too often it looks like this. It looks like picking money off the ground. It's just like, it's too easy. And the reason it's too easy is because, not because uh, Web3 people are less security aware or they don't know how to do their job, it's because they start and say, okay, I'm not a target yet. I don't have to invest heavily in security yet. Um, maybe I'm just like two or three guys in a garage working and thinking about some dream. Um, and we can do security later. It's not, it's not a pressing issue. We just started, no one knows us. Why should I invest in security that early on? But if you combine that with this effect of hypergrowth that you see very often uh, in Web3, that Web3 projects get launched and everyone's get excited about that, everyone is going to that project. So what happens is you get the $3.8 billion that have been stolen uh, in, in hacks in 2022 alone. And if you zoom out and look at the whole like say five years, you get over 10 billion USD, which is a lot of money uh, we could have saved. And another reason it's very different is because when the threat actors, when the attackers are financially motivated, you need to remember that in Web3, every app is a financial app. It's just so much easier to steal money or something that has the immediate money uh, value and not steal data and then s sell the data to make money, right? Just like way, way, way easier to steal an NFT, steal some stable coin or token projects and then make money immediately off of it. So what should you do? Let's illustrate your Web3 uh, project. You have your team, you have your DAP that you're developing, and then there's the attacker. The attacker come from like many different backgrounds. Um, everyone loves the North Korean attackers, right? Uh, but we see them in like a wide variety of backgrounds um, all over the globe, and they're trying to both hack directly your team and compromise the team, as well as compromise the project and so try to hack that. And it's important to remember that in some cases, also the team itself may be, may be a threat. They may be flip against you and try to take the money that's been part of the project. So with so many threats um, 
I want to go over three basic principles that we see for Web3 security. And I want to start with this quote that I really love from a very smart person uh, in the cybersecurity space. Many times when we build projects, when we build a uh, big software, so everyone is like doing a different job within the company, within the project. And the only person that actually is getting paid and has some kind of upside from understanding all your projects, all the aspects of your system, is the attacker. And you never want the, this is too often the, the truth, but you never want it to, to actually be the truth, right? You don't want to imagine that the only person who actually spent time understanding all the nuances of how your system works is someone from the outside trying to hack you, and no one on the inside saying what could go wrong, and what should I do against that? So first principle is that you need to be able to control your team. You need to control your team not as a principle on its own. You need to control them so you can actually trust them. It starts with roles and permissions. Roles and permissions basically limit the blast radius that you have uh, within your team. And why do you need to limit the blast radius? Because you never know. You never know some of these people can be uh, operatives recruited by the Iran government, the North Korean regime, or some cybercrime group. But they may also just be hacked, right? They're not at fault. They may be just open the wrong PDF file or Excel file because someone sent them a job offer or um, an invoice they have to pay, and they just double clicked, and the attacker now sits at their computer, able to, from there, move laterally across all the system. And at this stage, the attacker has the exact same permissions and control that you gave that, gave that person. So you need also to combine access control. You need, to make, you need to make sure that only the right people have the right access. For example, you probably have a business dev person, right? A business development person. Maybe he's a great guy, but does he need to be able to upgrade your smart contract with new code? Should he be able to like, change balances? Not necessarily, right? So there's no reason to give that person that access. The second thing is that you need to choose wisely and map your infrastructure. It starts with a multi-stage, multi-factor approval for key management, meaning that no one person is able to just initiate a transaction on, on their own and finish it. And it goes on to mapping everything, mapping everything that you have both on-chain and off-chain to make sure you know what you have. And finally, you need to plan for when you get breached, because a breach is going to happen in some way. And you need to sit and see what's your incident response plan. You need to sit down and identify how would you hack your own project? Because you know it the best, right? Just sit down with your tech lead for 30 minutes and figure out what could go wrong. How would they attack this, the, the system if they had to? And I want to highlight here an amazing example. Um, and I'm not going to talk decentralization versus centralization, but when there was a vulnerability, an exploit in the Binance Smart Chain, their response managed to limit the attacker's profit from 570 million USD to just 100 million. You cannot respond that fast if you don't plan ahead. What Firebox offers you to do that is a combined four layers secure architecture, uh, starting with a zero trust design, so you don't have to trust any component of the system. We leverage hardware security modules and we leverage uh, distributed wallet infrastructure that stopped with enterprise grade policy engine to make sure only the things you want to go through and only the approval processes you want to support is what's happening. Thank you for your time. Feel free to reach out if you want to chat more about this.